I want you to hit me as hard as you can. In the late 90s to early 2000s, a renaissance of strong female action heroes was in full swing. Xena and Buffy were the leaders of this genre, and their shows would lead the way for a future generation of women kicking ass on TV. But there was one show that fell through the cracks, despite being created by a legend in the film industry. A show that, in addition to having a unique look, was just plain fun. I, of course, am talking about James Cameron's Dark Angel. Yes, the show that featured baby Jessica Alba riding motorcycles and kicking ass, in the role of Max Guevara, a genetically engineered super soldier on a mission to find her brothers and sisters, all while being hunted down by Manticore, the shadow government division in charge of creating her fellow super soldiers. This show featured a lot of elements that are pretty standard nowadays, genetically engineered superhumans, evil corporations, and cyberpunk environments. But at the time, they were fairly new concepts that were quite rare to find on television, in addition to nicely mixing together comedy, action, and even a dash of romance. While it was not a perfect show, Dark Angel still has a certain level of charm that has inspired dedication from its fans 20 years later. But is there enough dedication to make this angel fly once more? Do we want to see Jessica Alba wearing that leather jacket again and barreling down the streets of a post-apocalyptic Seattle ready to kick some ass? Well, let us find out in this installment of Gone But Not Forgotten. <laughs> Dark Angel hit TV screens on October 3rd, 2000, with the show being created by Charles H. Egley and James Cameron. These two men both started in the business together when they worked on Cameron's first movie, Piranha 2, The Spawning, back in 1982. And decades later, they would form a production company, Cameron Egley Productions, and began to develop a TV show. The two men went through a lot of options on what kind of show they wanted to make, and at the time, Cameron wanted to make an adaptation of the manga, Battle Angel Alita, but everything was still stuck in development hell. So Dark Angel became like a training ground for Cameron's Alita movie before that flick finally saw the light of day in 2019, with the show being inspired by not just Alita, but also the Y2K scare of all things. For those of you youngsters, the Y2K scare occurred when people were freaking out during the year 1999 that at midnight of New Year's Eve, the world would end. Believing that a lot of computer programs and operating systems were not equipped to change the date from 1999 to 2000. And looking back, it was pretty stupid that people thought that the apocalypse would be caused by a calendar change. But what can you say? We were pretty naive back then. So the world of our show has gone to hell, after a terrorist organization has set off an EMP that has crippled the United States, resulting in a police state where the city of Seattle has been divided into sectors, separating the city into a class-like system. Jessica Alba played the role of Max, the genetically engineered super soldier who escapes the secret facility of Manticore, where she was created. Alba is known by many of you for her many roles in films such as Fantastic Four and, um, uh, honey? Look, I'm trying not to be an asshole here. I know how popular Jessica Alba was back in the day, but I for one honestly don't remember her in anything other than this show and the Fantastic Four movies. Sure, she had some smaller, decent roles in Sin City and Machete, but other than that, all the other roles that she was in were just plain garbage. Anyway, Alba was cast in the show before a full script was even made, and at first, Cameron did not like her audition, but he kept going back to her tape. When Cameron finally met Alba, he was so impressed that he cast her on the spot and based the personality of the character of Max around that of Alba's. The pilot episode was aired as a two-hour special event, with our story beginning in 2009, as Max and 12 of her brothers and sisters escape the secret government base of Manticore. We then cut 10 years later to find Max living in a run-down, post-apocalyptic Seattle, where she survives by stealing from the wealthy and working as a bike messenger. 
It's during one of these robberies that Max meets Logan, a cyber journalist slash vigilante, better known by the codename of Eyes Only, who exposes the corrupt criminals who take advantage of the poor, and hacks into television broadcasts to reach the public with his exposés. When Max refuses to help him, Logan ends up getting shot and winds up in a wheelchair, thus forcing Logan and Max to begin working with each other. And over time, these two would develop feelings for each other. And it is their relationship that elevated this show to something special. Logan was played by Michael Weatherly, and he was my favorite character. I felt that unlike the other people on the show, his was a fully fleshed out portrayal. The guy had to deal with living life as a paraplegic, and how his strong ideals affected his personal relationships. In one episode, he learns that his family's company is involved in providing weapons to corrupt police officials, and intentionally exposes his family's involvement, which causes him to lose his fortune, which in turn hinders his ability to work as eyes only, since he now has fewer funds to rely on. I think one of the reasons I like Logan is because of my fondness for a comic book series called Transmetropolitan, which revolves around a character named Spider Jerusalem, a cyber journalist who uses his words to put the rich and corrupt in their place. If any of you out there could check out Transmetropolitan, you definitely should. It's a pretty fun graphic novel with a dark sense of humor. And although its violence can be quite graphic at times, it is a good read all the same. The chemistry between Weatherly and Alba was particularly amazing, and it probably helps that the two of them were dating at the time, and briefly got engaged. You could not help but get sucked into their growing relationship on the show, which starts out as a deep respect, grows into a strong friendship, and then eventually leads to romance. The two-hour pilot was a good start for this show that successfully introduced all the show's characters. But I have to say that Alba was not very good in this premiere episode. I would say that her performance came off as robotic, but I don't want to insult actual robots. Okay, okay, I'll ease up on her performance. She did get a lot better as the show went on. I think the problem I had with her in the pilot is that she can't find the balance between sarcastic and serious, and her dialogue comes off as stilted as a result. She would get there though, as Max slowly began to become more vulnerable as a character, but every once in a while still took some time to crack a sarcastic line. Other members of our supporting cast were introduced as well, as Max had many friends who also worked at Jam Pony as fellow bike messengers. Most of Max's friends were just used as comic relief on the show, except for original Cindy, the girl who would wind up becoming Max's roommate and confidant. I honestly hated all the rest of Max's friends on this show, as they wound up being just shoved into episodes. You would be watching an episode of Max trying to rescue hostages from a building while the supporting characters were outside the building, speculating on what was going on inside the building. They didn't even know that Max was even involved in the rescue. And thus, I am left thinking to myself, what was the point of this scene? Also, most of the humor at the beginning of the season was pretty forced. For example, when Sketchy, the idiot of the group, winds up losing a package of money from a group of gangsters, it leads to an awkward moment of non-comedy. So let's see now. You pay me 20 bucks a run, two runs a week. That's uh, 2,080 a year. Divide the 15 G's. So to make things right, I will work for you for free for 375 weeks, which works out to be the, the uh, next seven and one fifth years approximately. Uh, make me a counter offer, guys. No, I'm just kidding. Even though these mobsters would actually whack him right there on the spot, or at best cripple him for life. But nope, he is just given a deadline to pay back the money, and Max has to go and win all that money back in the casino with her magic powers. This is not to say that all of the humor was bad, as one of my favorite episodes of the show involves Max going into heat. Yeah, that happened. Max has feline DNA, which causes her to go nuts for a few times each year. 
it's pretty funny to watch, as we see original Cindy having to stop her from humping every guy in sight, which results in one of my favorite moments of the show. I know you left out. Are you alright? Thanks. I need that. One thing I was impressed by in particular was the show's representation of LGBTQ characters, specifically original Cindy, who was a lesbian at a time when gay characters were not seen very often on television, although her homosexuality was heavily censored by the network. But regardless, there was one moment that stood out to me. In the episode titled Out, Max's annoying uptight boss, Reagan Ronald, better known by the nickname of Normal, winds up dating Louise, who he eventually learns is a trans woman. Now back in these days, the joke would be that Normal would be shocked and disgusted to have been dating someone who is trans. But instead, this is what happens. I thought about this long and hard, and I, I realized that it doesn't matter. You know, it's 2020. I'm a modern man. I've realized something about myself these past few days we spent together. And it's going to change things between us. I'm gay. In what sense? I'm a lesbian, Ray. I think that season one was pretty solid overall. It had some decent action and compelling storylines that revolved around Max and Logan's budding romance, as well as having her trying to stay one step ahead of Manticore. It was also fine to miss an episode or two of the show and not be lost on the plot. For the most part, all the episodes in season one stood on their own. However, it was in season two that I felt that the show began to suffer. In the second season, Manticore's base is burnt to the ground, only to be revealed that the program had a cult-like origin, which involved them performing failed genetic experiments called transgenics, with Max's character now being elevated to the status of a quote-unquote chosen one. I just felt like there were too many concepts being introduced into one season, although it wasn't without some good aspects, such as a transgenic character named Joshua, who has canine DNA. At first, he is a terrifying creature, but would turn out to be very kind at heart. Sure, this character may be a bit of a cliché, but Kevin Durant is such a good actor that he sells this part, instead of just phoning it in like so many other actors would do. Besides, there were so many worse aspects of this season, such as the idea that to prevent Max and Logan from being with each other, she gets infected with a virus that is specifically made to kill Logan if she touches him. Then there was Alec, the typical bad boy character with the heart of gold. Actor Jensen Ackles tried as best as he could to sell this character of a rogue super soldier, but to no avail. He was always annoying Max, but secretly wanted to help her change the world. God, it was so freaking boring. The series would end on a cliffhanger before its cancellation, which is what usually happens with great shows. But why did this show get cancelled? Academy Award winner James Cameron, Dark Angel, Fox Fall. Oh, you mean that Fox produced an amazing show and then almost immediately cancelled it? No way! How could a supposedly quality network ever do that? Well, at least they won't make that mistake again. And again. And again. Okay guys, now it's time to play a special game of Bingo! the Fox Network strategy for killing off Good Shows Edition. First off, Fox interrupts the show to broadcast sports games, music specials, and election coverage. Check! Next up, Fox decides to move the show to Friday night. Check! Then, Fox decides to cut all advertising for the show. Check! And finally, Fox cancels the show because its ratings have plummeted, and it's gotten too expensive to produce, when everything they just did to the show has caused the ratings to plummet, thus making the budget too expensive to sustain, and pissing off millions of fans. Alright, you got a bingo! You know what, let's get some bonus points in here, with Fox telling James Cameron, one of the greatest directors of all time, that the show he poured his heart into was renewed. 
only to call him three days later to tell him that it was actually cancelled instead, and pissing him off so much that it causes him to never work in television again. Now it's time to go over the question we always ask. Should this show come back? I would say probably not. The problem with Dark Angel is that what made it unique and fresh in 2001 has been done to death by 2021. If a new take could be done, something new and intriguing, then I think it could work, as unlikely as that may be. But if anyone could do it, it would be James Cameron, who has frequently been counted out only to prove his doubters wrong on a massive scale. Still, even if nothing can be done, Dark Angel is still a cool slice of nostalgia. Sadly, I have not been able to find any place where you can stream the show. It seems like the DVDs are the only way you could watch it. So if anybody out there knows another place where the show can be watched, then please post it below in the comments. And if any of you out there ever have the chance to watch Dark Angel, I highly recommend you do so and get ready to barrel down the road on a cool-ass motorcycle and throw yourselves off buildings with Max Guevara. You will be guaranteed to have yourself a ball. How do you talk to an angel? How do you hold her close to where you are? How do you talk to an angel? Like trying to catch a falling star I'm Jesse Shade speaking on behalf of David Arroyo for JoeBlow.com, and thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel, tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support, and we will see you next time for the next installment of Gone But Not Forgotten.